IPCC has in its last report um, put a very ambitious goal forward um, uh, to arrest uh, climate change uh, in, uh, uh, with, with two degrees Celsius. We need to find ways of, uh, of getting uh, carbon out of the atmosphere. That, that becomes pretty clear uh, that we have to uh, go down in our GHG emissions quite dramatically. Um, and, and they came up with, uh, with different scenarios how we could achieve that. Um, and, uh, and whether we do that with uh, carbon capture and sequestration, you see all these um, emissions are, are up there, whether from transportation, buildings, industry, so they're all still positive. We need over the next hundred years to get them down, to become more carbon neutral. But if we want to balance the climate, um, we need to have some negative emission scenarios. And these negative emission scenarios um, can be achieved according to IPCC, uh, either with this mainly BEX technology, and I'll, I'll show you that later. That's basically capturing carbon dioxide from el electricity generation and injecting it into geological strata. Um, or if we don't have that in our hands, which might be likely that we don't, we need to have a lot of options of um, putting carbon into forests and other land use systems. And these are quite large numbers. So you see minus 10, even maybe uh, uh, greater emission reductions and, um, and sequestration. And what really didn't come uh, into play uh, enough uh, is the opportunity to sequester carbon in soils. And, and if you look at these numbers, you immediately realize that there is much more carbon in soils than there is atmospheric CO2. There's also much more carbon in soils than in all the global vegetation combined, uh, about 10 times more. So just a little bit of change in soil carbon contents will make a big difference for atmospheric carbon dioxide. And yet, the word agriculture or the word soil didn't appear in the uh, Paris Accord. The word forest appears, but the word uh, soil and, and, and agriculture did not. However, we have, in addition to soil carbon in forests and forest carbon, which is an important uh, aspect of uh, arresting climate change, we have a lot of opportunities to put carbon in soils and reduce emissions uh, from soils in agriculture. And, and this is a paper that came out earlier this year um, that gives you a rundown of, of a sort of a decision scenarios, what you could do um, to uh, reduce climate, uh, uh, climate gas uh, emissions and, and put carbon in soils. Um, you'll see here um, different ways of doing that. Um, that have different potentials, uh, some very uh, uh, relatively high, restore histosols, though on, on very few land area. Um, water management and set asides um, have uh, a role to play, but you see they are only uh, in the area of 0, 0.0 something petagrams of uh, carbon dioxide equivalents per year. Um, whereas then there are some other soil carbon sequestration opportunities that need to operate um, at uh, an extensive area in the world, um, a lot of uh, um, uh, land area needed for that, but relatively low carbon dioxide emission reductions and sequestration um, per year and area. And those are grazing management, cropland <laughs> management, uh, enhanced root phenotypes, with the, which is a very new area um, of research to look at uh, the ability uh, to breed plants to put more carbon in soil uh, and not compromise um, crop yield. And, and the fourth is biochar application, um, which is a relatively new area of research um, that I would like to talk a little bit more about because we have been quite active in this area. So the technical potential of all this together is about eight gigatons, and, and we need to get there. Um, however, some things are not included here. For instance, um, uh, reduced emissions from uh, um, uh, degradation and, and uh, uh, deforestation is not included in, in this graph. So I want to spend, um, uh, to get to my uh, topic of, of bioenergy with carbon sequestration, um, uh, just a few slides on, on uh, recapping what biochar is. Biochar is a pyrolyzed organic matter. When we change, uh, when we heat up um, organic matter, uh, it fundamentally changes its chemistry 
uh, organic uh, oxygen and hydrogen is volatilized at about 200, 300 degrees, and we make this fused carbon. Um, what that means is that we're linking carbon together, um, and, and you know this material uh, as, as graphite, you know it also as charcoal, uh, you know it also maybe as very condensed carbons, as, uh, as diamonds. Um, carbon can do magnificent things, um, uh, depending on how you treat it, uh, and, and depending on the temperature, um, it, it fuses together um, more uh, in, in greater clusters, and that means also that it is more persistent in the environment. And we all know that because we, we use charcoal dating um, for quite a long time uh, because charcoal is, is so persistent in the environment. So cluster sizes of, of this size produced at uh, 600 temperature, for instance, um, will uh, in, in most instances have a mean residence time of over a thousand years uh, in the environment. And, and so the mean residence time of a leaf that would decompose in uh, a week or a year would then have mean residence times of several hundred uh, to possibly a thousand years. So th that's, that's, a, that's a quantum leap in, in reduced decomposition. And what that means for atmospheric carbon dioxide is uh, in the natural carbon cycle, well, I shouldn't call it natural, but the non-pyrolysis um, uh, 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 carbon cycle, all the carbon that goes in the soil as plant litter is released to the atmosphere um, in uh, relatively short periods of time. Um, so that's carbon neutral. However, if you pyrolyze the material, the residence time in the soil is decreased, so less returns to the atmosphere, um, and uh, the atmosphere is reduced in carbon dioxide. And there are, there are plenty of natural examples and traditional soil management techniques that uh, David will talk about in a minute. But that's not the end of the story. Very interestingly, and uh, that's information that we have actually uh, gained uh, um, 10, 20 years ago from uh, traditional soil management techniques in the Amazon, um, that these, these uh, ring structures in the soil, these naturally occurring ring structures, um, that are, uh, constitute uh, about 50% of the carbon in, uh, in mollysols um, in, in the Midwest. That's why they're so fertile. Um, these ring structures are decorated with carboxyl groups, um, these charged groups. So this little minus here um, that is preferentially located on these, on, these, uh, on these ring structures has a high potential of retaining nutrients. And that's why these soils, mollysols, um, uh, these black soils, these black Midwestern soils, but also the so-called chernozims in, in Russia are, are very fertile. So this stuff is not ha only hanging in there for a long period of time, it also makes the soil very fertile. And that means that um, uh, char added to the soil on average increases um, crop productivity. This is a meta-study by Simon Jeffrey from uh, Wageningen University uh, who looked at all studies that have been published until about three years ago um, and, uh, and established a mean value um, of about 20 degree, uh, 20 percent uh, crop yield increases. But you see, there's a high variation in that, and uh, we need to find the, the soils, and this is the, the soil pH values, um, uh, uh, how they react in, in terms of a change in crop productivity. So we need to target those soils that react the, the most to this kind of amendment. Um, and, and already a few years ago, we did a, a global analysis uh, what these soils would look like and where, where they would be uh, in the world um, and, and uh, looked at the, the, the crop yield increases that we could attain um, if we had a global program of that sort um, and, and whether it would be even worthwhile doing that. And, and indeed, there, there was an advantage um, uh, of, uh, of going that, that pyrolysis and biochar route compared to uh, uh, direct combustion. Um, and, and this is a projection, a modeling exercise um, that's published about six years ago. Um, over the next 100 years, the annual um, uh, net avoided emissions uh, that can reach under different scenarios, the different colors are different scenarios. Um, and you'll see that the dotted line, that's when we were just making electricity with, with biomass versus the, the solid line uh, when we're making electricity and adding carbon back to soil. 
So clearly, the, the solid line is always above the dotted line, uh, so we can reduce more emissions and sequester more carbon uh, if we go that route. Um, so in, in short, biomass is um, thermally treated, half of the carbon goes back in soil, increases crop productivity, the other half is going towards an energy uh, system, and, and that can be uh, quite varied. Actually, it's quite interesting, if you go into the literature of the 19th century, you'll realize that uh, a lot of our bioproducts, whether it's the stuff that's in the chemistry shop um, or, um, or, or any other materials, were made, made with, this, um, with this process uh, because we didn't have fossil fuel. So now, now that, that link to, to BEX versus what we call BEP, not a great acronym, um, uh, so the, the, the BEX that is in the IPCC scenarios means um, we're taking photosynthetic carbon, um, the carbon that's in, in biomass, uh, in leaves and, and wood. Uh, we're making energy out of that, we're capturing the CO2 from that energy, and we're putting it into geological strata. We're pumping it into, um, probably together with oil ref uh, refineries, uh, or, in, or an old oil refinery, uh, an old um, uh, uh, fossil fuel uh, extraction processes. Uh, and put the CO2 into deep geological strata. The approach that I would like to introduce to you to, um, today is that we are not doing that geological carbon sequestration, but we're still producing energy um, and putting uh, the biochar in the soil where it can improve soil fertility, restore soils, uh, and improve food security. The argument why why such a system putting carbon into soils didn't get into IPCC or was not considered in their scenarios, whereas BEX was, um, is that obviously you are generating 100% um, of the energy stored in, in the uh, biomass you're gener uh, generating energy from, and uh, about 100% goes then into the ground. Whereas in this scenario, you're only generating energy from half uh, the energy content of the, of the biomass and, and, and only half goes in the soil. So, so the thinking is that this would always win out over that because you get more energy and more carbon sequestered. And, and this is what we wanted to see, whether, whether there are other ways of looking at that. I mean, one obvious one is that this carbon down here, apart from uh, climate change mitigation, doesn't have any other uses, right? It's just down there and hopefully it's just down there. <laughs> Um, it might come back up at some point. Um, there might be also unintended leakage, um, and, and it's technologically not yet um, fully uh, uh, explored. And most countries have stalled and, and, and abandoned their, their programs in this area at this point. Um, so, so it's not quite, quite clear whether this will ever materialize and when it will materialize. But in principle, um, this, 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 is a, this is an interesting idea to contemplate. Uh, whereas here, as I demonstrated earlier, and David will demonstrate uh, for, for African um, uh, traditional cropping practices, has uh, a, potentially a significant role to play in improving soil fertility, so that the, the carbon that we sequester has actually a use beyond climate change mitigation. So this, this is now the, the, the paper that I introduced earlier, uh, that just came out two, two weeks ago, and, and we have a booth over there, Cornell has a booth over there, um, and I'm, I'm happy to, to talk with you more about it. Um, we looked at the relative net present value. So there was an economic analysis, um, whether uh, the uh, BEX, this geological carbon sequestration, how it would stack up in its economic um, value, against the biochar sequestration or just energy production without any sequestration. And this is a little hard to read, um, but, but you see the, the, the different colors. Um, uh, and, and you'll see here, um, they, this was a simulation exercise, a uh, rather el elaborate one. Um, and, and you see a lot of parameters played a, a role, um, and, and there are not a lot of different combinations possible, uh, what the crop yield impact is, what the discount rates, discount rates would, would prevail, how persistent the char is, uh, the crop price increases, of obviously um, the carbon sequestration costs um, for the BEX is, is important there as well. What we found is that actually uh, the relative present value um, uh, only for BEX only increases when the carbon price and is above all the others when the carbon price is relatively high. 
um, above about a thousand dollars per carbon dioxide equivalent. And this sounds like crazy numbers, um, but uh, since we at the moment have carbon prices that mostly be below ten dollars, um, but but those are projections that possibly by the end of the century we will have uh, carbon prices that are are nearing three digits. Um, and 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 you'll see that that biochar uh, sequestration, so carbon sequestration in soils uh, linked to um, energy generation uh, will have a sweet spot somewhere in the middle there um, when carbon prices increase uh, but are not so high that, that, the, uh, that the banks would, would um, uh, possibly prevail if it becomes uh, technologically feasible, which is at this point is not yet certain uh, that it ever will. Um, so in other words, um, Soil carbon sequestration linked to bioenergy generation will be available earlier and at a lower price um, than what the IPCC put on the on the uh, on the map for balancing climate. Um, so, which which soil effects were important? And, and this is maybe the the, 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 the big uh, discussion point. Um, and because I told you that that it's um, that this peculiar uh, chemical compounds are, are so, so effective in retaining nutrients. Uh, in fact, when we do a, an analysis of all studies that have been done um, to date, uh, soil ability to retain cations, which is this acronym CEC here, um, is, is among the, the, the top predictors for, for success. So what we need to do now is, is um, um, similar to our fertilizer programs or compost programs, we need to start understanding uh, where such amendments make sense, um, develop decision uh, trees um, uh, so that extension extensionists can can work on that um, and, uh, and and give us a, a, a more nuanced bi uh, picture of, of uh, its its appropriateness. Uh, so where to from here? Um, even with soil management systems, I think we have to think cross sectoral and 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 not get stuck in 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 the silos of this is either energy or this is soil carbon, or this is forest, and this is ag, uh, this is household, and this is garden. They all, the carbon only is there once. Um, we need to put it where it has the greatest value, uh, not just for climate change mitigation, but also for other eco ecosystem services. We need to establish networks of soil management uh, monitoring and leak existing models, remote sensing, and field experimentation efforts, uh, support commercialization, of, um, uh, and scale up of, of industry ready technology, uh, design these decision support systems that I introduced, um, and engage communities uh, to develop the knowledge transfer. Um, because photosynthesis um, approaches are always distributed, uh, biomass cannot be hauled around uh, for very long. Um, and that's also one of the Achilles heels of BEX, that we would need to put something that's very distributed onto one spot where we can inject it. It's much easier and will be much uh, more energy friendly and, and environmentally friendly if we can keep carbon distributed uh, where it has its long term, greatest long term benefit. Thank you very much, and I'll hand over to David who will talk about um, African dark arts. So, Johannes just told you about the different scenarios and how carbon can be used in different systems. And what I'm going to show you is, is that how traditional societies, for example, systems, not conventional systems, but indigenous systems, manage to use what he put it so eloquently in different pictures and then also in different uh, uh, papers. So if you see these things, these are 700 years old indigenous African soil enrichment systems, which managed to take carbon, which otherwise would have been you know, emitted, and we're able to create a system where you can use it as a mitigation strategy and at the same time also sequester, uh, improve soil fertility and productivity. So if you see this, for example, all over the world, non-degradation is, is, is intrinsically linked with food security and malnutrition. In fact, more recently, 40% of the Earth's space surface is, is considered as degraded. So much so that uh, UNCCD has declared by 2030 as, as a land degradation free zone in the world. So they are working towards that. But if you see systems in Africa, for example, there are places where this system or indigenous societies are working towards enhancing crop productivity, uh, creating societal and environmental resilience, 
uh, and using carbon for climate change mitigation and adaptation. At the same time, they're looking for the states for opportunities where such systems can be incentivized using carbon financing and payments for ecosystem services and benefits. This is not a conventional system, but this is an indigenous system. So if you see this thing, are there indigenous soil enrichment systems that can serve as a climate smart alternative to conventional agriculture? Johannes has given you the strategy and what we look at is, is that there are, yes indeed, there are systems in the Amazon, there are systems in the interior Indonesian Borneo region, or there are systems in West Africa, especially in the Upper Guinea forest ecosystems, where they manage to use carbon to enhance soil fertility, to enhance food security, to use it as a means for mitigation and adaptation, and also enhance societal resilience. So there is a socio-economic benefit, there is a climate benefit, and an environmental benefit. So if, you, if I can give you an example, for example, this is the type of soil. The original soil in the, in the system is this. This is very, very acidic, very, very low in its carbon, and, and highly infertile system. However, this indigenous management systems changed this carbon into this one. If you look at this thing, this is a black soil, which is rich in carbon. This is a black soil, which is nearly very, very low in its pH. Johannes indicated, for example, one of the impacts of adding carbon in the soil is carbon exchange capacity and also improving soil pH. This pH, for example, here is 5.5 to 6.5, which is ideal for every kind of microbial process or for the growth and development of plants. Whereas this one is 4.3, it is very, very acidic. So basically, this is the demonstration by one of the farmers where he says, we managed to change this one into this using our own system. So if you take measurements and to verify this thing, uh, for example, this is, is up to 300 or two to three times more carbon in this soils, which are over here, uh, rather than this one. So there is an actual amount of carbon which is being sequestered in this one. And about two to 26 times, or two, up to 26 times of this carbon, or, or the majority of this carbon is the pyrogenic carbon or biochar or black carbon that Johannes was actually talking about. So Johannes is using the convention systems and, and, and give you the, the, the different simulations and all that, but indigenous societies have actually managed to create this and managed to demonstrate this. These are happening in remote areas and, and we have to go in and, and bring it out. Uh, the other one is, if you see globally, for example, phosphorus is a very, very important nutrient. And this days, in fact, it is absolute, it's, it's very, very short. So its supply is very limited. The other one is nitrogen, which is, again, uh, uh, goes to the atmosphere in the, in the form of NTOs, or it's also a very precious uh, uh, resource which is industrially produced. So these systems manage to create up to 270 times phosphorus to sequester, oh, sorry, to put in the system. So in terms of soil fertility, these are highly fertile and highly productive systems. How do they do that? Really simple. This is what Johannes was talking about in reality. Johannes was showing you different pyrolysis systems where energy is related to that, but these indigenous societies don't have pyrolyzers or something. The only thing that they do is actually pyrolyze the system. This is, they start with this, and this is the, the material that they put in. The other thing that they put is a simple thing. Bones. Bones are rich in calcium phosphate. If you analyze bones, and every human being, or if you take them from animals or anybody, they are rich in calcium phosphate, and this is primarily their source. The other thing is ash and organic material. Johannes was telling you, for example, how major or how pyrogenic carbon has a potential to sorb other organic material. So, in reality, yes, it's a pyrogenic carbon which is staying in the soil system and which is being sequestered, but the most labile form of carbon, which will be decomposed in two to three months, is also conserved. So, these societies were able to create, in fact, if you look at what they say in their own world, we were working with social anthropologists, for example, here's what they say. They say, God made the red soil, but we put the dirt there and made it fertile. So this is their way of telling you that they have managed to create a system which is much more fertile than what God originally intended. Well, let's say God created that. So when you look at these systems and when you take a radiocarbon dating using 14C, 
then it comes from 115 to 700 years old. So this thing is relatively new compared to the ones in the Amazonia or the ones in, in the Borneo, but within the time frame of this one, you can transform something which is 0.5% carbon or basically a carbon-free soil into something which is up to 1 meter 80 accumulation of carbon. This is a massive amount of carbon which is resold. No modern management system, no modern agricultural system or no modern conventional soil management system has managed to create something like this. <coughs> so, if you see economic benefit, Johannes was talking about economic benefit, if you do something without socio-economic benefit, then it is absolutely useless. If you look at this thing, we, we surveyed about 2,900 hectares, and these soils are just about 29. So basically, they are 1% of the total area. But look at this thing. This 1% attributes or contributes for 26% of the food consumed by the society, or up to 24% of the farm household income. So if you multiply this thing by four, then in reality, with 130 hectares of land, with 130 hectares of land, you can be able to feed the society which is in that part, and you can take about more than 2,500 hectares of land out of agriculture and return it to, let's say, forestry or other systems. So there is a huge potential. When they describe this thing in their words, here's what they say. Anything that you plant in the red soil can grow well in the black soil. However, the black soil and, and black soil plantain, banana, and other important crops for them are, are growing very well, which cannot grow in the red soil. Basically, what they say is the black soil is the chief of all soils around here. They, they consider it as the most important or the most valuable soil compared to the one which we see everywhere, whether in the United States or any other, which is the, the, which is the red soil. So what we did was this. Basically, we learned from the systems and we wanted to test them whether they work in modern systems. So we organized some young users which are unemployed and we asked them to collect the same material that these societies were using as, 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 as that. Uh, and then we developed appropriate technology in Ethiopia where soil fertility, land degradation, carbon sequestration and, and other issues are, are important. And then we use the same pyrolyzer. Johannes showed you an industrial level, but this is just the lab, a desktop level. And then we used a mixing and binding using uh, uh, molasses and other materials. And the goal is this thing. This is the most expensive fertilizer in the world, phosphorus fertilizer. And if you see, it is pelletized. So when you introduce a technology to, to communities, it has to have, it, sh it should be somehow similar to this. So we pelletized it. Uh, and then we actually packaged it, uh, and very well, you can buy it and, 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 and in groceries and all that. And at the end, if you see these pellets, and this, this fertilizer, which is the most expensive fertilizer, are somehow similar, the consistency and everything is the same, but it has a 70% equivalency to an available phosphorus compared to this one. If you compare this thing with rock phosphate, which is commonly mined in America or elsewhere, this is four times better. So in fact, yes, they managed to create it, but we were also able to re reproduce this thing. And it, when what we did was we tested it. We have a series of our networks of on-farm trials, and here is what you see when they don't use in soybean, for example. Uh, and, and then when, when she puts it in soybean, then she can get up to more than she can more than double uh, her production. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, the, the the yield of soybean. The other thing is, as we tested it and, and the most common cereal crop, which is maize, you can see that those farmers really understand randomized complete crop design and all that. And look, when they don't apply fertilizer, this is what happens. Literally, there is basically no yield, and these people are, are will be subjected to you know, malnutrition and, and, and hunger. Whereas they put this thing, which is cheap, because they can't afford commercial fertilizers, which are fossil, fossil fuel based. And as soon as they do that, then they can basically double or triple. These yields are in the range of 6 tons per hectare or 6.5 tons per hectare. And if you look at the yield in the United States it, uh, using commercial fertilizers, it is just about 8 or, or in some cases up to 10 tons per hectare. So using locally available resources and using these techniques which Johannes just demonstrated, indigenous communities were able to produce and use it for 
enhancing carbon, sorry, enhancing soil fertility, enhancing productivity, and also as a mitigation and, and, and adaptation strategy. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.